Shopify grows your business no matter how far or big you grow. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. Whether you're selling your fans' next favorite shirt or an exclusive piece of podcast merch, Shopify helps you sell everywhere. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S. Allbirds, Rothy's, Brooklinen, and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. Plus, Shopify's award-winning help is there to support your success every step of the way. Because businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash income, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash income now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. Welcome to my award-winning podcast, Thoughts from a Page, a member of the Evergreen Podcast Network. My name is Cindy Burnett, and here you can expect author interviews as well as chats with other book lovers about their recommended reads. With so many books coming out weekly, it can be hard to decide what to read, so I find the best ones and share them with you. If you are looking for a community of readers, bonus content, and a chance to read books before they hit the shelves, I hope you will consider joining my Patreon community which is filled with a wonderful group of book lovers. The link to join is in the show notes. Do you love to be in the know about upcoming books? I have recently worked on two different projects. The first is a 2024 summer reading guide that highlights 45 fabulous titles that I have read and loved and that will make great reads for this summer. The guide is 12 pages long and you can print it and it contains my comments and thoughts on each book as well as what type of reader the book will appeal to. The second project is with Kelly Hooker of At Kelly Hook Reads Books. She and I just recently produced our second literary lookbook, which is a list of 393 titles releasing from May to October 2024, curated for our communities. The link to buy both is in my show notes. Today, Susie Orman Schnall returns to chat with me about Anna Bright is hiding something. Susie will always be such a special author to me because she was my very first interview on the Thoughts from a Page podcast, and I loved her two historical fiction books just as much as I loved Anna Bright as Hiding Something. So if you haven't picked up those, make sure you go back and grab them, as well as this one, because it is really so entertaining. It had me on the edge of my seat. Susie is the author of five novels about ambitious women. Anna Bright is Hiding Something, We Came Here to Shine, The Subway Girls, the Balance Project, and On Grace. She's the mother of three sons, and she grew up in Los Angeles, graduating from the University of Pennsylvania, and she now lives with her husband in New York. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Are you tired of seeing your teen or young adult struggle on a path that clearly isn't the right fit? Is your teenager confused about which direction to take after high school? The future of work is changing rapidly, and our kids need to know all of the options available after high school so they're empowered to make the choice that is best for them. In each episode, we explore the latest trends that are shaping the opportunities of today and tomorrow. I'm your host, Betsy Jewell, and this is the High School Hamster Wheel Podcast. Welcome, Susie. How are you? I'm great. I'm so happy to be here with you, Cindy. Thank you for having me. Well, I am thrilled that you are back. You were my very first interview for the podcast, and it's just so much fun to think back on that and how far we've both come. I know. And I just remember us talking when we were like baby industry people about innovating and and building our brands. And it's just so exciting to see all of what's happened since then. So in addition to being my first podcast author, you are also my first literary salon author with Amy Popel, and you are coming back again this fall in September. So I'm really looking forward to that as well. Thank you. So am I. So fun. Well, I love this book. I had a blast reading Anna Bright is Hiding Something. I just sped right through it. And then I got to the end and my name was listed and that was such a surprise and I was delighted. Thank you. Oh, of course. I mean, I there are so many people who have played a part in my career. And I I just feel so grateful to everybody, including you. 
Well, and back to your mention of our early days, you were so much help for me. I would bounce stuff off of you all the time. And with your marketing background, you helped me in countless ways. Thank you. It is helpful to have that marketing background, especially now when I have to do so much of the promotion and marketing of the book. So it's something that I actually enjoy and I think it's fun. And I think it's really hard for a lot of authors that don't have that experience. I think that's right. I mean, I find it hard. Yeah. And so I can definitely see where authors would as well. Well, let's dive into talking about your book. Give me a quick synopsis of Anna Bright is Hiding Some. Okay. And thank you so much for saying those nice things about it. I'm so happy that you enjoyed it and that it was a quick read for you because that was my goal. I wanted people to really tear through it. Um, so Anna Bright is Hiding Something is a very cinematic uh, read that's a mashup of Hulu's The Dropout, which is about Elizabeth Holmes and Theranos, and Netflix's Inventing Anna. So it's set in the very glossy worlds of Silicon Valley startups and New York City new media, and it's pretty much a ripped from the headlines story that explores the fascinating world of female entrepreneurs, and it focuses on two main characters. So the first character is Anna Bright, who is the, the name of the book, Anna Bright is Hiding Something. So Anna Bright is a very enigmatic business founder of a company with a $10 billion valuation called Bright Life. And Bright Life, as the book opens, is on the verge of launching its groundbreaking new product and going public with its IPO. But Anna Bright is committing fraud and nobody knows it yet. Not her investors, not the media, not her employees. And everybody who thinks that she's just the next big thing and the next unicorn is, is really being had. The second main character is Jamie Roman, and she is a young, bold business journalist who is in awe of everything that Anna represents. She's kind of idolizes Anna and, and her status as a, as a female founder. But when Jamie uncovers the fraud that Anna is committing before anybody else, she embarks on a bicoastal journey to uncover that fraud and take Anna down, hopefully making a name for herself as a journalist. So soon enough, Anna finds out what Jamie's up to, and then it becomes a cat and mouse game where they are both trying to one-up each other, uh, but only one woman will come out unscathed at the end. So in, even though it's about Anna Bright, who is a fraudster, it's really a love letter to hardworking business women who are creating businesses of value, um, who are so underrepresented in venture capital funding. Um, it's a story about ambition, women in the workplace, and really the true meaning of success. As I said, it is a page turner. I sat down one afternoon, thought, okay, I'll read a little bit and go do some other stuff. And I did not get up till I had finished it. So I just loved it. Wow, that is music to my ears. Thank you so much. Well, good. I'm so glad. But one thing that I really have thought so much about since I was finished, and I'm dying to know what you think of this. I find it frustrating when there are so few women out there leading these startups or really even Fortune 500 companies, when a woman is not a good role model, when she's doing things she shouldn't be doing, like committing fraud. I know it's not fair to assume every woman should be a good role model, but when there are so few of them, it makes me a little angry. Did you struggle with that? A hundred percent. And that is why, yes, I'm so glad you brought that up because I talk about that a lot in the book as well. And there is such underrepresentation at high levels of women in leadership positions and founders. So it was a bit difficult for me to center a fraudulent female founder as my main character. But what I try to do in the book is really highlight other characters who are founders who are doing things right. And one of the things that has been very well documented in news articles is called the Elizabeth Holmes effect. And Elizabeth Holmes, for those who don't know, was the founder of Theranos, which was a blood testing business. And she there, there was fraud going on. Um, fascinating book called Bad Blood by John Kerry Rue, who is a Wall Street Journal reporter. And also there is a television series called The Dropout on Hulu, as well as a podcast that are all fascinating. So if a businesswoman does anything wrong, they're immediately associated with Elizabeth Holmes, even though they might not be doing anything similar to her. But it really has tainted the ability for women to go to venture capitalists to try and raise money because they all assume that a woman 
is doing, especially in biotech, whatever Elizabeth Holmes did. And it's so unfair because it doesn't happen for men. You know, the founder of WeWork is not, it's not like every man is held up to his standard just because he committed fraud. It's not like every man who goes to raise money for his company is being associated with him. So yes, I really wanted to make sure in the book that even though Anna is committing fraud, she is not meant to be representative of every woman who is trying to raise money from venture capital. I agree with everything you just said. And I think it's wonderful to have this story in the fictional world because there has been so much about similar stories and Elizabeth and other people in the nonfiction world and in the real world. And so I'm glad you took it and, and wrote about it. But just personally, as I was reading about her, I was like, ah, oh, you know, one woman can really mess everything up for the rest of the women. And it's totally unfair because it doesn't happen to men. But it just kind of made me mad as I was reading. But it didn't take away the impact of your book at all. But it's just one of those things that it made me think a lot about it, which is good. Yeah, it, it makes me mad too. And that's part of why I actually wrote the book, because of the inequities between the genders in the industry. In fact, 2% of all venture capital money goes toward women and even less toward women of color. And so it is, disparity is mind boggling. And it's, I think, got a little bit better last year. I don't have the statistics. That's from 2022. I don't have the 2023 numbers, but it's just, it's just horrible. It is horrible. And I think your book highlights that, which is good. And I continue to think about it, which is also good. Good. I'm glad. So your last two books, which I loved, were historical fiction. You have returned to fiction with this one. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Yeah, so my first two novels, On Grace and The Balance Project, were contemporary women's fiction. And my third and fourth novel were, as you said, historical fiction. But they I don't feel in the sense that I'm changing genres, although technically I am because I'm going from contemporary to historical back to contemporary. However, I consider myself an author of novels about ambitious women. They just, some of them happen to be set in the past and some of them happen to be set in the present. But I really don't consider myself having switched genres. I just consider myself having changed the time frame in which my female characters are dealing with the personal and professional challenges in their lives. So what I like to do is take kind of either a setting. So my two historical fiction books, one was set within a contest from the New York City subway system called the Subway the Miss Subway's Contest. And that's my book, The Subway Girls. And my most recent historical fiction was We Came Here to Shine, which was set at the 1939 New York World's Fair. And so those two were based on settings. My first two, one was based on Grace, was based on a woman turning 40 and returning to the workplace. And The Balance Project was based on work-life balance. So I either take a theme or a setting and then plop women into those frameworks and see what they do. And see how ambitious women have to pretty much claw their way through these challenges and through these settings in order to come out on the other end. Well, that's a great way to look at it. And I'm always all for authors switching up genres. So even if you are, I think that's wonderful not to be pigeonholed in one particular place. Yeah, it's hard, though. And I think authors who are listening to this will, will acknowledge and be nodding their heads and readers who aren't aware of it should know that it's very hard for an author to change genres and it doesn't always work within the industry in terms of getting publishing deals, et cetera, because editors like to, I don't want to use the word pigeonhole because I think that that has a negative connotation, but there is a benefit to staying in your lane because they think that you develop a readership and that readership wants to come back to you for what they know you for. However, the way that I look at it is authors shouldn't have to stay in a lane if they don't want to. And I, as a reader, like to read so many different genres and that, and I don't expect the authors who I follow to always write the same things. I think that's right. And I think that thinking that readers can't determine what they want to read or do any kind of research sort of sells readers short. If you have a new book coming out, I'm always going to read what it's about, whether or not it's in the past or in the present. I'm not just going to be like, Susie's got a book. I'm reading it because there are so many topics. And most likely I am going to read what you're writing, but I'm always going to look it up and read about it before I add it to my list. So I think the fact that that publishers don't give readers credit for that is a little crazy. Yes, I agree. 
I don't know. It just kind of drives me nuts. And then I keep seeing authors that are switching genres and they're having to get pseudonyms. And then that gets so confusing. And I just wish it were a lot less complicated. Yeah. And I don't know how much of it is based on data and how much of it is based on assumption. So I, and I don't know if it really can be tested, you know, based on, on what's happened in the past, because I think it's just something that is, there's a lot in publishing that is, this is how we've always done it. And so I don't know if all that is true, that readers won't follow certain authors if they change genres, um, or if it's just an assumption and they, there is no way to kind of test it. I think that's right. I just wish it would change. And I do feel like there are more authors that are writing across genres. And so hopefully that will just continue. Yeah, I hope so. I know it's, it's, it's much easier for authors who have a very, very strong readership and a tremendous amount of support from their publishers. There's an easier way for them to do it. But I, I agree. And I think a lot of authors I know are switching genres, going from women's fiction to thriller. We know a lot of authors in common who've done that and have been very successful at it. So it's happening. Publishing is such a hard business to be in. There's so much rejection. There's so many unknowns. There's so much uncertainty about what makes a book break out that I think a lot of authors who I speak to, most of us talk now about we have to do what we love. And you have to write the book that's going to resonate with you. You can't just write the book that's going to sell. And I know that that's a very privileged thing to say, but I think that if you're not going to love what you're writing, then it's just too hard to spend all those years with a particular book. I also think it comes through in the book. So if you're writing what you love or what you're interested in, that shines through on the page. If you're not that excited about it or you're writing something formulaic because that's what you've been told to do by your publisher, that also shines through. Exactly. We've all read books by authors who have written the same genre for, you know, 20, 30 years. And at some point, it just it just starts to sound like they're phoning it in and, and nothing sounds unique. Exactly. So let's talk a little bit more about your research. You mentioned a couple of things, but what kind of research did you do? So I think that the book began because I had already been doing research, which is interesting. Usually I pick an idea and then I start doing research and the book comes from there. But this, I was actually fascinated in the subject matter originally. So it kind of started around the pandemic. I became fascinated by the world of female founders. And just to put a little bit of an asterisk on that term, female founders is a word that's used in the industry for female entrepreneurs. And there's a lot of criticism about it because we don't gender male founders. We don't call them male founders. We just call them founders or entrepreneurs. But for some reason, women have taken on the label of female founders. And I think in some ways it's necessary because you need to be able to talk about certain venture capital situations and, and statistics in terms of women founding companies, because that's where you can really see the differences between who, who's getting funding and which, I, which business ideas are moving to the top, et cetera. But I know that a lot of women don't like those terms, but I'm going to use them because it's just, it's just the way that the industry talks and it's just easier. So as I was going through the pandemic, I was just really fascinated in the world of female founders and a lot was going on during that time in the news. And I subscribed to a newsletter called The Broadsheet by Fortune. And it's fascinating. And there are tons of news stories about women in business. And so at that time, I read Bad Blood, which was, as I said, the book about Elizabeth Holmes by John Kerry Rue. And I was just so interested in this world. I thought it was fascinating. And I thought it would be really interesting to explore the ecosystem of the female founder world through fiction, because I started looking for novels about it. And there are definitely a lot of workplace-based novels about women, but there aren't a ton of novels about female founders or female entrepreneurs. And so that's how I got the idea to write this book. So I started off doing research really about some very prominent female founders, the ones who were behaving badly and the ones who weren't. What's very interesting in the world of female founders specifically is a lot of them, they become the brands themselves. So, and I talk about this in the book about that there are some women who 
want to put themselves on Instagram as the face of their brands. And to some respects, that's a very positive and beneficial way for them to build their business. They become accessible to their customers uh, and identifiable women in, for some brands, that's very appealing. But on the other hand, when things start going wrong or that woman, that entrepreneur does something wrong, all of a sudden it's connected with her brand. And so that's where a lot of the problems start to begin. So anyway, so I did a lot of research on founders. Um, I had to do research on IPOs and taking a company public and valuation. That's something I knew nothing really about except for what I'd heard anecdotally. But luckily, my husband is in finance. So I was able to ask him a lot of questions about that. But it was really interesting learning the different stages of IPOs and, and taking a company public. I had to learn a little bit about journalism because my main character, Jamie, is a journalist. And what's really important to me through for any book I write, especially the historical fiction, but also for this, is that my facts are, are correct, that I'm very authentic in the worlds that I'm creating. So I really tried to do as much research as I had to for that, especially when it came to the product that Anna was inventing. And I don't know if you want to get into that now, but uh, I did a lot of research on that world too. Well, and I know we're going to have a spoiler-filled conversation for my Lit Lovers Patreon group afterwards. So you can highlight that a little bit here, but we're going to do a deep dive into all of that when we talk after this. Okay. Yeah. So the product that Anna creates is an ocular implant, um, which means a lens that is inserted into the eye that interfaces with a subdermal microchip um, implanted below the eye that communicates with a website and a smartphone app that has a, a, a suite of functionality. So I know that's all very confusing, but when you read it in one place, it all kind of makes sense. But it's basically Google Glass, which some people might remember was an actual pair of glasses that Google had all of this functionality behind. But the product that I have Anna Bright inventing, which is called Bright Spot, is basically an implanted Google Glass. So there's no visible hardware. Somewhat terrifying as I was yeah. reading about it. Yeah, a little science fiction-y. Exactly, which was fun. Coming up on 5-Minute News, I'm Anthony Davis. You might think it's partisan because maybe it's critical of one side or the other, but it's not, it's just the truth. And I think that's also something that's kind of unusual for Americans listening to the radio or to podcasts because... The news landscape in the States has been so partisan for so many decades. So 5-Minute News is verified, truthful, independent, unbiased and essential world news daily. Hi there, I'm Heather Drago. And I'm Sarah Saunders. We host the podcast, That's a Hard No, about saying no and setting boundaries. So you can become that true and empowered you that this world needs. Saying no isn't just okay. It's the key to living an authentic, fulfilling life. I'm a licensed professional clinical counselor. So while this podcast is in no way a replacement for one-on-one -on -one therapy, I suppose I know what I'm talking about. I'd say so. We talk about learning to say no and set healthy boundaries and how it impacts mental health, physical health, relationships, parenthood, and more. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and visit our website, hardnopodcast.com. We're here to help you find your no and say it unapologetically. That's a hard no. Which character was the easiest to write and which was the hardest? That's such a good question because I think they were both the easiest and the hardest. I identify way more with Jamie, my journalist, just because she's more of a rule follower. She's more of a head down, do your work, get it done, conform to business practices and relationship norms and all of that sort of thing, while still being very ambitious and wanting to get ahead and, and break the rules necessary in order for her to, to accomplish what she wants. So that was easy, but it was also hard because I, I felt a little badly for her. She's trying so hard to succeed for a number of reasons that I go into in the book. 
And I just really wanted everything for her, but I had to keep putting roadblocks in her way, of course, to make the novel interesting. In terms of Anna Bright, my entrepreneur, she was a little hard to write because I had to get into the mindset of somebody who is very narcissistic. And that's just not a personality trait that I can identify with. So that's another place I had to do a lot of research is how someone becomes a narcissist, what are the traits of a narcissist, and how would that come out in terms of their interpersonal relationships. That had to be super interesting. Yes, it was. Well, what about what surprised you the most when you were writing this one? What surprised me the most is how easy it is if you are a very bold and outspoken person to get people to believe what you are saying. And that's what I had my character Anna Bright do. That was the part about Elizabeth Holmes that just completely fascinated me when I was reading her story was how that was how she succeeded. She just acted like everything was happening and everybody believed her. And there's an element of that that happens with even non-fraudulent founders. There's a saying in the industry called fake it till you make it. And basically, a lot of companies, as they're being founded, have things that don't go right. And in order for investors to stay happy and to continue getting different rounds of funding, the founders and the, you know, the management have to say certain things are going well because they know they're going to go well. You know, there are going to be blips on the road for any company that's being developed, any product that's being developed. And for the most part, most of these things will be figured out. But what happened with Anna Bright and what happened with Elizabeth Holmes is it got to the point where the science couldn't keep up with the promises, but they refused to admit that. And so I think for most companies where they are faking it till they make it, the promises eventually do meet up with the science or or the other way around, and the company will launch with a legitimate product or, or service. And so they're not committing fraud. They're just being positive. Do you know what I mean? There's definitely a difference. Absolutely. And that's what I think that Elizabeth Holmes and and my character, Anna Bright, were just unwilling to admit because there was so much that they invested both financially and personally with their time. These, you know, these companies were absolutely everything to these women. They breathed in the air of these companies. It was all that they did. Every their entire life was these companies and these products. And so it would be impossible for them to admit that it was going to fail because how could you reverse all of those hours and years of work? They just didn't want to admit to themselves that it, that it was going to fail. Well, and part of the characteristics of a narcissist are that you won't admit it. I mean, they just couldn't even see it themselves. Like, you know, we're just going to keep saying this. We're not going to say we're wrong. Right. And what happens, I think, also is that these founders surround themselves with yes people because people want to keep their jobs. People want to keep their financial stake. You know, if you're an early member of a new company, you have options in the company. And that could be a lot of money when the company goes public or gets sold. And so people don't want to leave. And so, or they sign NDAs. And so there's a lot at stake for for all of the people involved in this brand and they all want it to succeed. And so you have a lot of people telling you, yes, we can figure it out. Yes, we can figure it out until at some point they cannot. And I also think that a lot of these people think, how cool would it be to be on the ground floor for something like an ocular implant and to say, I worked for that company. I was part of the launch. Yes. Especially because in my story, the way that I build it, the world is waiting for this product. This isn't just something that some people have heard of. The media has gone bananas for Bright Spot. And it is everybody, it's on everybody's lips and everybody wants to know who the early adopters have been who've gotten to be implanted before the company even before the the product even comes out. And so there's just a lot of buzz in the world and everybody's talking about it. Exactly. So of course you'd want to be somebody who was a part of that. Yeah. Well, what about the title and cover? Can we talk a little bit about those? Yeah. So my original working title was female founder. And I found myself talking about that and getting blank stares because I think people who aren't immersed in this world and who don't read a lot about women in business don't really know the term female founder. And so I didn't want to have my title be confusing. 
I also didn't want it to sound too much like a nonfiction book. So between my agent and my publisher, and we all kind of got together and everybody agreed that even though Female Founder would, was, I, I loved the title and I thought it that is what it is, it wasn't going to serve the novel in the best way. So we then all put together lists of other ideas and Anna Bright is hiding something one out. There was another, it's funny because now I have to look up what, I, I think, I think Bright Young Women was a title that I came up with and then found out that that was Jessica Knoll's book. Oh. <laughs> I think it's called Bright Young Women, but I love that title for this. I was would have loved to have used that, but Jessica got it first. Yes, exactly. It's hard sometimes the race to get a title out there. And I loved all the plays on the word bright in your book. Yeah, thank you. So my, so Anna Bright, it's her last name, but it also becomes the name of the company. I thought and that, that she's well. smart. She's bright. Exactly. I thought all of that kind of played in together. Thank you. Well, you're part of a group, the Thursday Authors. Can you talk a little bit about that? I just love when these author groups come together and I love seeing what you all do. Yes. So the Thursday Authors started during the pandemic when there were several authors who I was friendly with. We all had books coming out in 2020. And one day, one of the authors said, do you guys want to jump on a Zoom on Thursday at five so we can kind of strategize about what we're going to do with our launches considering the world is going through this? And it just then became something that we did every Thursday at five o'clock for a couple years, I think. And it wasn't that we were excluding our other author friends. I feel badly about that sometimes because I have so many wonderful relationships among authors all over the country. They've been the most supportive people. It's been such a wonderful thing to become friends with authors because we just speak the same language and everybody's so supportive. I'm, I'm so impressed with the female author community that I am part of. But the Thursday Authors is a group of seven of us, and we decided at some point, somebody found out about us and said, oh my gosh, I would love to be a fly on the wall of one of your Zooms. And so we started doing live Zooms where we put them on Facebook and people started tuning in. We started a, a platform on Instagram that we post every week. We post our Friday reads and our Friday TV so people can see what we're reading and we love getting into conversations with our followers about what they're reading. And that's a lot of fun. And really, it's just been a, an incredibly supportive group for me. We text each other all the time. And it's just it's just been wonderful to help each other and support each other with our work. I love the group, each one of you and all of your books. So what a fun thing to be a part of. Yeah, thank you. And I'll just name who the Thursday authors are. It's Jamie Brenner, Fiona Davis, Nicola Harrison, Susie Leopold, who's a book supporter, she she is a book blogger. Uh, Amy Popel and Linda Cohen Loigman. That's an alphabetical order, and um, it's just a really interesting group of women, all so smart, different genres, and we've just really been uh, wonderfully supportive of each other, which is so nice to see. Yeah. Well, before we wrap up, Susie, what have you read recently that you really liked? I really loved *The Frozen River* by Arielle Lahan. I've been finding that I've been listening to books a lot more now than reading them. For some reason, I'm just finding a lot more time to listen. And I'm so impressed with audiobook narrators. They just bring such a different element to stories. And I'm unfortunately blanking on the name of the narrator of that book, but she was magnificent. And I just, the, the Frozen River was so atmospheric and such a good story and had everything that I love about reading in that book. And I, I will say the same thing about The Berry Pickers by Amanda Peters. I really loved that book as well and recommend people pick them both up. And right now I'm listening to Funny Story by Emily Henry, which is so good. Good romance. I love it. I've heard that the Emily Henry is really cute. And The Berry Pickers was one of my favorite books of last year. Was it? Yeah, it's so good, right? It just takes, transports you and such a good story. Just loved it. And you have a big pub day. There are so many good books coming out on your pub day. So yeah, it's so exciting because there are a bunch of authors coming out with novels and, and memoir on June 4th, and we've all banded together to do some fun things together, giveaways, et cetera. And those books are, Chelsea Devantes is coming out with a memoir called I Shouldn't Be Telling You This. Brooke Lee Foster has a historical fiction called All the Summers in Between. Annabelle Monahan has a romance called Summer Romance. 
Olivia Munter has a book called Such a Bad Influence about influencers. Jane L. Rosen's book is Seven Summer Weekends. And Julie Setao's book is called When Women Ran Fifth Avenue, Glamour and Power at the Dawn of American Fashion. And it's nonfiction and fascinating about women running department stores. So lots of great books coming out on June 4th. I've read all of them and highly recommend them. And Anne Leary has an essay collection, I've Tried Being Nice, which also comes out June 4th and is fantastic. So many great books. Great. And another book I've heard really good things about is Swift River by Essie Chambers. Yes. Heard great things about that one, too. It's funny how there are just certain pub dates where all the books are coming out. And I feel like that is a win-win for everybody, because if you go to the bookstore for one book and you see all these other fantastic books coming out, you just pick up one after another. And pick up them all, right? Because exactly. like, who doesn't want a TBR that's going to fall down one day? <laughs> I'm not sure I really want that, but I do have that. <laughs> I think, right. I think I already have that. It's like the amount of books that I have here that I'm just dying to read. I, it's just too many, but it's I can't stop myself from buying them. I have that exact same problem. Well, Susie, I always love chatting with you. And this was just wonderful. Thanks so much for coming on the Thoughts from a Page podcast. Thank you, Cindy. I really love listening to all of your interviews with so many interesting authors and getting behind the scenes with you on books. So thank you for including me. Absolutely. Don't you know that you're a grown up? I'm a grown up. Me too. Yep, me too. But you know, these days being a grown up can really suck. Luckily, we're grown ups who grew up in the coolest generation. We had video arcades. And also some of the best TV and movies ever made. We lived the origin of awesome consumer electronics. The list goes on and on. Yep, Generation X. Exactly. And we're Gen X Grown Up. Every week, the Gen X Grown Up podcast explores media, tech, toys, games, and more from both yesterday and today. Through the eyes of Generation Xers who absolutely love that stuff. You can find us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Or find us on our website, genxgrownup.com. All right, you think that was good enough? I, I hope so, man. I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> Who listens to a promo on a podcast and then goes and listens to a different podcast? Right. <laughs> I, I, I've never done it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Allison Holland, host of the Kennedy Dynasty podcast. Equipped with a microphone and a long-term fascination of the Kennedy family, I am joined by an incredible cast of experts, friends, and guests to take you on a fun, relaxed, yet informative journey through history and pop culture. From book references to fashion to philanthropy to our modern expectations of the presidency itself, you'll see that there is so much more to Kennedy than just JFK or conspiracy theories. Join me for the Kennedy Dynasty podcast. Thank you so much for listening to my podcast. I would love to connect with you on Instagram or Facebook, where you can find me at Thoughts from a Page. If you enjoy the show, please consider joining my Patreon group to access bonus content and support the podcast. If you have a moment to rate the show or subscribe to it wherever you listen to your podcasts, I would really appreciate it. It makes a big difference. And please tell all of your friends about Thoughts from a Page. Word of mouth does wonders to help the show grow. The book discussed in this episode can be purchased at my bookshop storefront, and the link is in the show notes. I hope you'll tune in next time. History is complicated. The story of human progress is long, messy, and riddled with controversies big and small. On Conflicted, we dive headfirst into history's most infamous events and contentious figures. We try and untangle the good from the bad, the fact from the fiction, and the monsters from the misunderstood. Was Genghis Khan a murderous butcher or a civic pioneer? Did the Allied powers go too far in firebombing the German city of Dresden at the twilight of World War II? And how did the Marquis de Sade acquire such a sinister reputation? And was any of it true? These are just a few of the tough questions we wrestle with and investigate on Conflicted. So if you love history or just enjoy a good story, please join me, your host, Zach Cornwell, for a fascinating new topic each and every month. Conflicted, a history podcast, is available on Spotify, Apple, or wherever else you get your podcasts. I hope to see you soon. Hello. 
and welcome to Novel Conversations, a podcast about the world's greatest stories. I'm your host, Frank Lavallo, and for each episode of Novel Conversations, I talk to two readers about one book, and together, we summarize the story for you. We introduce you to the characters, we tell you what happens to them, and we read from the book along the way. So if you love hearing a good story, you're in the right place. Our ninth season is coming this fall. Tune in to hear from some of the all-time great authors, Charles Dickens, Jules Verne, F. Scott Fitzgerald, and more. Subscribe to Novel Conversations wherever you listen to podcasts.